So, um, as I mentioned in our discussion earlier, you, you're not responsible for the work that was the yep. inspiration for yep. these investigations. So, um, there, there are quite a number of empirical problems with the premises on which the Thornhill and Fincher and the Schaller enterprises are built. Um, empirical problems with the nature of ancestral human populations, yep. the way in which diseases spread through populations, yep. how human populations are different from um, non-human populations, and so on. Right. Um, those empirical problems are, I think, sufficient to lead us to at least raise a question mark over whether what we see here is um, exclusively the functioning of an evolved domain-specific adaptation. And in mm. fact, some of those authors at times are um, themselves ambivalent as, as yeah. to the extent yeah. to which they think that's yeah. the case, right? So uh, that opens up the possibility that what we're looking at um, in the larger enterprise and more specifically in yours uh, is some um, interaction of, for example, cultural evolution and a, a set of social psychological mechanisms um, yep, uh, and that it's not exclusively a very, very bounded domain-specific adaptation for disease avoidance. Okay. Yep, and I think that matters a lot because while your investigations are intriguing and your results are very interesting, I'm concerned that it's often the case that your controls are not exploring the same patterns that um, your experimental manipulations are. Right. So what I would like to see you do is, um, I mean, it's easy to sit on the sidelines and kibitz and say, you know, yep, sure. here's what you should do next. But I think it would certainly improve the evidentiary value of a lot of the material that you have today if in your individual differences measures, your you have complete symmetry between your control and your experimental condition. So in your experimental condition, you're measuring perceived vulnerability to disease in many of these studies. Yep. And then you're priming people with either cues of violence or cues of disease. Right. Okay. Um, and the fact that you don't get an interaction between individual differences and the violence prime, you have interpreted, at least in your presentation here, as domain specificity. Right. I would interpret that as inadequate measurement of the individual differences that matter for your control condition. Right. So perceived vulnerability to violence may show exactly the same kind of interactions with your yep. gun prime and yep. not with your disease prime, yep. which is consistent with there are evolved mechanisms for thinking about the costs and benefits of different kinds of social relationships, and we're exquisitely sensitive to group boundaries, and yep. dialects and accents are a good marker of group boundaries. Right. Um, and culture supplies us with a bunch of information about the positive and negative affordances of different outgroups. Right. Yeah, I agree. So we do have some extra measures. We haven't gone as far as I think would, that would satisfy your uh, criticism. But we do ask people to tell us, uh, in some of the voice studies, women uh, rate themselves on the femininity of their, uh, their own voices and their appearance and so forth. Uh, we ask them how to rate themselves on physical attractiveness and physical strength. We ask people to supply their uh, height and weight. So, for example, if there's some formidability things going on, and the gun primes, violence, well, formidability correlations, and, well, people have been doing that for a little while now, so we might expect, yeah, indeed, that there might be some correlation between, say, physical strength and your perception of your distance from those people. Um, so far, we haven't observed any of those kind of correlations. Maybe we need something much more closely aligned with these kind of individual difference measures rather than the physical sort of measures, but... Um, the best I can do is say we have measured a few other things and as yet we haven't found anything else. Um, the other thing which we have measured but haven't yet investigated is we ask, we, we, can, we include a measure of current health. So it's, uh, forgetting the name of the authors who came up with it, but basically it's a, a frequency and recency measure. So we have six or seven typical kinds of maladies that you get. We ask people how recently they've had it, if at all, and then, if so, how frequently? And so that should give us a nice additive index of current health. So it's possible, and I don't know yet, that we might find some other evidence which converges on our uh, assumptions. Maybe people whose physical health is less uh, robust uh, than others, maybe the effect would work stronger for them, which would be at least convergent evidence for our assumption. So I agree. I think we need more convergent evidence and that, yeah, I, 
there are, we've basically treated the gun's prime as if it's a, some kind of fuzzy, nothing happening condition, when in reality, surely there is something happening. So, yeah. Yes? I have two quick, very quick ones. Um, okay. The first one is about like, following up on the use of guns as a control. Mm -hmm. Because my concern methodologically is that what, what you're manipulating it could be as simple as level of threat arousal. Yes. Do you have measures of that? Because nope. just subjectively, I'm sure most of us, especially in a climate with the media being so saturated with images of gun wielding yep. baddies and so yep. on, we may right. be habituated. Yep. I didn't personally feel nearly the flinch factor. Yep, right. So right. what do you think of that? Uh, the best I have with that is I, I sort of mentioned earlier on, we have a measure in there which asks people, were you able to watch the whole time, yes or no? And if they answer no, then the next follow-up question is, estimate the percentage of the time that you had to look away because they knew they were watching for three minutes. And so we do find there's differences. There are some people who have to look away quite a bit. And it's As you would expect, it's more likely to be women, people who are more likely to be disgusted by pathogens. Uh, but if we control for that, we still observe the same patterns. So again, it's kind of a similar reaction to what I have to your question, which is, yeah, I, I recognize that the, the methodology there are other interpretations of what's going on in these primes and that we've not spent any real time going through controlling for other potential things like arousal and threat level or whatever that might be. And they're perfectly reasonable things. I think that's a valid criticism. I don't think that's yeah. a fatal... No, I don't think it's the, fatal the, either, but the, I... The, the, the dependent measures, the, the results you have... Yep, are things are coming up the right yeah. way, yeah. But it's just, I, I would imagine that this isn't the first time that question's been raised. So I'm just curious if in the future you're going to do this. So huh. my, yep. my second quick one is... Um, about a third variable explanation, but similar to what Dan was bringing up, um, yep. where there's pretty well-known correlations between right-wing authoritarianism, yep. conservatism, disgust, sensitivity, and... and oh, kind of okay, I didn't know it was... Okay. Yeah. okay. A lot high agency colleagues have yep. found some things uh, All right. related to... Oh, okay. All right. So I, I'm wondering if, if you've given thought, or maybe you have data you haven't reported, that probes, um, like, if, for example, if you put in a regression model, things like, mm. they're, you know, political orientation and things right. like that, what, what wins out? Mm, okay. Yeah, no, we haven't tried that. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing that's sort of in our favor is that we moved to the, the three-dimensional disgust scale, and we are at least finding that it's the right one correlates and not the other or others. Um, yeah, okay, so there are, there are other individual differences. Um, yes, actually, <laughs> do have other data. So another thing that you might expect to be correlated would be gender, because we know that women are score higher, particularly higher, on the pathogen disgust measure. They're more likely to French and freak out. Um, there's a possibility that different ethnic groups would react differently. So um, particularly if you're from an environment where you're, you know, your early history was one where there are lots of pathogens, well, maybe your sensitivity threshold is more likely to be primed than if you were from an environment which is relatively low on pathogens. So what we did was the same studies before. Unfortunately, we thought we would try our luck, and we measured pathogen disgust at time one and then did the study. Turns out it is a bad idea. It was a smart idea to measure at the end. So there are some effects. There are significant effects, but they're very modest. So we've compared the effects for speakers that are in-group speaker, and I think that's Sierra Leone again, for white males and females, and then the way our samples work, we have non-white, so it's a pretty big mix. So I'm, this is pretty dramatically ridiculous because we're lumping together Asians, African Americans, and Hispanics, and others. So we are seeing some differences. So non-white women are basically showing the effect mu most dramatically, at least in these data. So there's a possibility that some of these other variables might be going in the background, but at least in this study, uh, we're not observing very clear effects at all, and where we are observing them are pretty pretty mild differences. So it does make sense. We did, it did occur to us to start looking at this, hence doing this, but um, so far it hasn't panned out. So we have some of these extra numbers, but they're, they're not null findings, but they're pretty damn close. Yes? Um, I find the fact that obesity goes along with this story a bit puzzling um, hmm. for, I guess, three reasons. One, because there are virtually yep. no communicable diseases of which obesity Second, because there's so much variation worldwide in whether or not obesity is perceived as unattractive. Yep. And historically, obesity is actually a signal of exactly the opposite. Yeah, you right. You were wealthy and doing very well if you were obese. 
Yes. And so I'm curious what you think the results of that would be if you went somewhere else. Bingo. And did it, yep. Or um, right. why you think that it because fits in with the with a pathogen story when there isn't any obvious reason why it should have been. Right. I mean elephantitis. Yeah. Every time people raise this objection, <laughs> they, they go to this. To uh, which and elephantitis is nothing like <laughs> nothing obesity. like obesity. Exactly. Okay. I've seen it many times fair in real enough. life, and it looks nothing like obesity. Nothing. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, there's um, a cute experiment they do in the psychology department for one of their training studies where they take students who are either going in to get lunch at a dining hall or coming out. And it turns out if you're going into the dining hall, uh, you're more likely to be relatively attracted to heavier looking people. And if you come out, it goes in the other direction. Uh, so yeah, there are definitely, some, and apparently it works about 50% of the time, so it's fairly robust given that they do it as a sort of an offhand kind of simple little study for their students. Um, so yeah, I agree that the, the, clearly there are features of obesity and there must be environments where people find that attractive because you live in some environments and you demonstrate you've got weight, well, you've got good access to resources and you're therefore you know, a worthy mate or, yeah. Uh, could be, I don't know. Um, you're also talking about disgust factors. So at the yeah. point at which point if the individual finds obesity right. gross. So what you're leading me to think of is perhaps if there's a difference, maybe moral disgust would actually be a part of it. Right? So the assumption that there's gluttony and that people who are heavy are taking too many resources. Okay, so I can imagine speculation. I can easily speculate, of course. But um, yeah, I don't know why it works. <laughs> I buy your argument. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. So, in the, in the last study, um, would you say that Exactly. I think that's why that works, actually. Um, we did do a follow-up recently where we found a guy who could do a southern accent and a standard accent more or less credibly and didn't work. Yeah. We got the observation for others, but not for him. What I'm yeah. wondering is, so because this is supposed to be about likelihood of interaction and yep. familiarity, so you would expect if you would put comparative uh, an Englishman or something mm. like that, that yep. Um, yeah. All right, perhaps. Yeah, I'm just wondering, it seems like there may be some, as other people have mentioned, other things going on here, and that would be one way yep. to try to disentangle. Yeah, so that was what we, that's exactly what we talked about when we first designed the study, which is, you know, obviously I have a tremendously sexy foreign accent. Surely women who are disgusted by pathogens are going to be falling over themselves to, you know. So clearly there are accents which are more sexy than others. So some outgroup accents actually produce, a, well, that is very attractive effect. So my guess is that those accents would be quite familiar outgroups that you know you're likely to be able to get along with. Now whether that would correlate with the perceived vulnerability to disease in what way or another, I'm not sure. But my guess would be... Uh, exactly. Well, my guess would be, say, a French accent. My guess would be that the high pathogen disgust people are still going to go, ooh, Frenchy, nope, don't like that. The low pathogen people might have that outgroup preference. Don't know. Interesting question to test. Uh, yes. Uh, yep. So uh, going back to the opening of your talk and your motivation for doing it, mm -hmm. uh, or, or what you said is one of the motivations. Yep. Uh, the correlation between uh, infectious disease density and uh, density of uh, indi surviving indigenous languages. I think there's a danger that there are other factors yes. creating that, although right. the R and P values look great. Uh, yep. But like, you know, where, right. has, been, where has been colonized? Um, where do they have it doesn't, actually. Where do they have, I'll like, jump ahead 10,000 slides. Sorry, keep going. <coughs> yeah. So um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I agree. So the present, that's really good, but. Uh, yeah, I agree. So I know I'm familiar with the rainfall effect. Sorry, I've got this extra stuff I stuck on there. There's Tower of Babel. There's the rainfall effect. So if you look at the rainfall effect, yeah, it's there, but we've got a tiny sampling of languages, and they're just kind of weird. So you can find that correlation that, you know, it's a pretty nice story, and there's something going on. 
but it's not nearly as dramatic and we don't have nearly as big a sample of accidents. So I agree that there are clearly other things going on. I think the thing that makes me relatively confident that there's something going on is that the finding just keeps coming out for a range of things that are at least consistent with the story. So it comes out with religions, it comes out for collectivistic social attitudes, socio-sexuality, uh, religions, languages, uh, intrastate conflict. I've, probably they've got another dozen as far as I'm <laughs> spitting these things out pretty quick. But the things we're observing, and yes, when they do throw in controls like uh, gross domestic product and things like that, you do observe some of these correlations going down. But I would say at least overall now, we're starting to see a fairly consistent picture across at least the kinds of things that make some theoretical sense. At least I imagine that would be a, what you know, Fincher or Thornhill were here, that would probably be their argument. And then I would probably also argue, well, yes, we've measured other things as well, and we still find our effect. So, okay, so it's a correlational study. Somebody's going to come up with another variable to control for and so on. I, maybe. Personally, I'd buy it. I think it makes theoretical sense. I don't know, maybe we'll take that bet in 10 years and we'll see what happens. But uh, my feeling is that it's capturing something real, but we're at a very early stage and we're still figuring out the mechanisms. Yes? Well, I mean, as I said earlier, you know, they could be right or they could be wrong, and it yeah. doesn't need to affect your research enterprise. Yeah, yeah, so right. The friendly advice is that you yeah. can pursue it without, without having it contingent on that. Yeah. Um, I, I, could you go back to the slide, the, the very last one on short-term mating? Sure. Um, um, so one concern that I have, um, yeah, is that um, it's important, it's particularly important, I would say, in, in formulating evolutionary hypotheses um, for the core issues to be subject to disconfirmation. And I'm very concerned mm. that this is an example of a case in which they're not. So. Let me tell you two different stories. Okay. If I remember your story correctly, you said that under high pathogen conditions, you should prefer individuals who are in-group similar yep. um, because of genetic similarity since under short-term mating, it's um, genes that you're getting. Yeah. In fact, yeah, you can make the exactly opposite the long-term right argument that you yeah. postulated earlier Yep. Argues for exactly the opposite prediction. Yep, looking for long term mates. Right. So, no, no, looking for short term mates. If, and the Red Queen hypothesis says that there is a co evolutionary arms race between the pathogen and the host. What mm. that means is the pathogen is host specific. If you accept that cultural boundaries correspond with genetic similarity, that's a premise, but if you accept that, okay, then it means that in-group members should be more susceptible to historically prevalent in-group diseases than out-group members, because yeah. in-group members will have, the pathogens will have evolved to exploit the susceptibilities of in-group members and not to sus exploit the susceptibility of out-group members. Yeah, so by so, your yeah. logic, this prediction falsifies the prediction. It's yeah. just that you can spin the predictions in all kinds of ways. You could say, oh, short-term mating, there the issue is sexually transmitted disease. It's not genetic similarity. And so now, you know, pathogen sensitivity matters. This um, concerns me a lot because I can come up with a story that fits the results no matter what the results are. I think that's always true, though. So my counter-argument would be that if you look at this data, we provided the pathogen prime, which is the mixed ethnicity stuff that we've seen the results on before. So if our assumption is correct, and the study three I showed you is right, then people are responsive to the nature of the ethnic constituency of the pathogen prime. So when you see diseased out-group members and in-group members, the effect seems to say, hang out with the in-group members, avoid the out-group members. So if that's true, that was, of course, our assumption, then that should be sortative mating for in-group members. But on, right? on those measures, you got no effect of sexual disgust, and you only got an effect of pathogen disgust. And then on these measures, you get yep. an effect of sexual disgust and no effect of pathogen um, disgust. We don't have an effect of sexual disgust. All we have is a manipulation of pathogens. Um, the individual so differences don't so come out. Oh, the previous study is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the previous one here is the perception of the number of people who are white. Yeah, so we don't have the attraction measures on this study. All we had was the perception of the sort of ethnic constituency well, of the people. Would you expect yeah. us to all cohere together? If 
you want to talk about convergent evidence. So why should sexual disgust be significant here and pathogen not? Yeah, I, no idea. So when we started out, I said, if there's something going to work here, it ought to be pathogen disgust. Maybe it'll be path sexual disgust, but it ought not be moral disgust. I think that's as far as we've got. So, so yeah. here, and this is, you know, I, I'm, I'm friendly to the entire yeah. enterprise, so yeah. I'm trying to be... I know, it's good. Thank but you. I think um, uh, here's where, if you say, look, I'm not wedded to this particular thesis that other scholars have advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm taking it as a starting point, and this is exploratory research. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, you're open to interpreting the data in a wide variety of ways that may then generate new predictions in the future yeah. that'll allow you to triangulate more closely. But as long as you continue to say, I'm certain, look, mm. see, look, languages, yeah, not right. religion, I'm certain, that's a right, exactly. focus. Yeah, so that's that's occurred to me just recently. So yeah, so so all far so far all we have done is accents and religions. So well does it work for just anything? So no, it shouldn't work for anything. It should work for things where you have a reliable cue to that group membership. So if we were to do an experiment where you manipulate contextually the correlation between the category and the cue to it, then we should find that as that degrades, the effect also degrades. But if we find it still works for relatively unreliable cues, then oh, well, that's not good. That suggests that there's some other basic tracking mechanism that's perhaps not this evolved mechanism. Maybe it's designed for something else or there's a compl completely different mechanism that we hadn't thought of. Yeah. But if you entertain the possibility that cultural evolution exploits the affordances of an evolved psychology that includes disease avoidance as one of its goals, right, then you can recognize that, for example, all major world religions use purity and pollution as a dimension along which they evaluate yeah. worth. Yeah. Right? And the more religious individuals are, all of those religions that you listed there have all kinds of taboos, they have all kinds uh, of... Yeah, true, but you can argue this in the opposite direction as well, that people who are religious do costly things much of the time, right? And there are, uh, well, anthropological data on uh, groups where you have ritual scarification and gentle mutilation and all those costly things which indicate group membership as well. Well, yeah, they're not, they're, exactly. they're opposite to the no, kinds no, of things that should no, promote health. The, the, the you know, point here health. is that if the disease avoidance psychology is being exploited Mm. by cultural evolution, then you would expect purity and pollution to be important parameters if cultural group selection is going to favor the evolution of religions which are parochial, that is, in which altruism yeah. is focused within the group. Right? And that's what your results are consistent with. That's yeah. a, that's a, it seems to me that a more complete explanation than to say, ah, well, um, you know, religion somehow activates the group psychology of the ancestral past since religion and language will have been isomorphic in the ancestral past. Right? Perhaps. But don't so. you have to argue what's illusionary and what's empirical? I mean, if, if there's certain standards that are illusionary, like for example, I was going to hold you in, in I was going to uh, uh, hold you up to your statement about certain accents are sexy. Well, in fact, no accents are sexy. It's our perception wow. that's that sex that that finds it sexy or not sexy. Mm -hmm. So the same thing in in societies have certain things that are illusionary, they're perceptual, mm. and they're, they're not necessarily based on any evidence. And so uh. the, we'd have to tease out what is, in other words, there's no correlation here between people actually getting sick and what they perceive they'll be getting sick, mm. whether they perceive they'll be getting sick. Mm. And perceiving they're going to be getting sick is illusionary. Actually, how many people did get sick might be some evidence of something. Right. Uh, but, uh, but I yeah. wanted to raise another point. Yeah. Right. And that is, uh, you're talking about a cognitive basis here, and um, I could quote a, uh, I can't quote the study, but it's, I think it's in Alison Gopnik's book um, where she talks about taking children, and you can take best friends in a classroom, right. separate them and give them red shirts and blue shirts, yeah. and they're going to be at war with each other. Yep. And then you take the shirts off and they become friends again. Yep. So there's certain conditions here that, that have to be factored in in that regard. Yeah. It, it, but it does demonstrate that there's something instinctual and in un, or at least yeah. unconscious going on. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that observation is basically consistent with what's called the minimal group paradigm. So the stuff basically began with 12-year-old uh, schoolboys in Bristol. They brought into the lab, showed them paintings of Clay and Kandinsky abstract paintings, asked them which they liked, and then gave them false feedback. Do you prefer Clay or Kandinsky? And they observe, and completely random feedback, 
uh, in group favoritism on the most flimsy of minimal criteria and has been uh, the most extreme version of it is explicit random social categorization is enough you can literally flip a coin well oh, you're a head you're a tail show them and that produces the effect as well um, so my argument for that is well yeah there are these things going on but again I I would think that that's presumably another mechanism it's it's definitely connected with group tracking but it doesn't account for why you would find these correlations with pathogen disgust and not the others and it doesn't explain why the pathogen effect would be stronger than the guns or whatever effect now of course the methodological take on that is well maybe it's the degree of threat and what not and degree of threat has been shown in other places but if it turns out it's not degree of threat and obviously we need to do more studies to make sure of that then the argument is well yes there are these proximate mechanisms but they don't account for these other findings so the observation at the start is if Fincher and Thornhill are right that that correlation is a real correlation, it's not caused by something else, then those models can't account for that. They're sunk. There's, there's nothing in those models that allows you to explain why environmental pathogen stress correlates so strongly with these things. Um, but is it developmental? I mean, if you yeah. use the example of language, there's a window of opportunity for learning language, and then yep. after that, you can, you can still learn a language, but you speak it with an accent. Yep. Okay. So in the same way, might there be something developmentally that's either more uh, sexual or... Yeah, but... The, and, and then what happens is we're talking about the adaptability of it. So yeah. if, you're, if you're put into a different social uh, construct, yep. you're, you, you have to adapt to that, and there's a certain plasticity that goes along with that. There's certain plasticity, yeah. And I, 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 there's a thing I've been mentioning this morning called the prototype magnet effect. Uh, which is basically, it's the cognitive mechanism that shows why these accent and things work. And it turns out the categorization stuff we're being talking about, mental representations of categories, there's lots of animals, cognition people go back and forth between exemplars and prototypes, fine, but there's plenty good evidence that when we mentally represent categories, we do them in terms of prototypes. There's a typical sound of E, for example. You can play tapes of E sounds and people can rate them for typicality. And it turns out that uh, the person who discovered this, his name's Cool, K-U-H-L, uh, it turns out um, young babies, when you play them different sounds, they can discriminate across all of them, as you'd expect, because you can learn, obviously, any language. Uh, it turns out macaques don't, have the <laughs> don't perceive differences, but it turns out adults do, and that when you play people a typical sound in their language and then follow it by a random other, you can't make the discrimination nearly so well if the first sound you heard was a non-prototypical sound. And so her proposal is that the prototype magnetizes these nearby sounds, which makes it perceptually impossible for you to make the discrimination. I would think that that might actually have a basis in some you know, evolved psychology, possibly, that maybe what's going on there is the reason that these accents and languages work and why they're such good uh, so well correlated with genetic distance and uh, with accurate perception, uh, accurate demarcation of group membership is because of that proximal cognitive mechanism. It seems that we've pushed the mechanism sort of to the bounds of what it can deal with, and so that when you encounter other people with other accents who make different sounds, you literally can't hear the distinctions that are so obvious for them. So, you know, obvious examples of the ma in Chinese, four versions, or is it five, I forget. Four, okay, I can't perceive the differences very well, but my student sure can, and he's surprised to learn that I can't do that. Um, but I would argue that the reason we have these sounds is I bet you people use them for quickly figuring out who is us and who's them. And I also bet you, and this is where I'm getting wildly speculative, I bet you when you meet person, people for the first time, the preponderance of those sounds and languages will be overrepresented in people's formal names. Because that's when you introduce yourself, you find out what the name is, and you quickly learn if someone can say, hi, <laughs> now you know immediately how close that person is to me. You know the genetic distance, you know how they're familiar with your group. So I'd like to do something on that in the future, but wildly speculative, I agree, but it would be kind of cool if it turns out to work. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.